The story of First Parish Church in Arlington is one that has particularly affected me because it's a great example of one of our communities actually living out our Unitarian Universalist values about the importance of forgiveness and more importantly because the fact that our religion is based not on creed but on covenant upholding our value of relationship how we are in relationship with one another in healthy and constructive ways for all is at the heart of who we are as a religious community the Arlington Church lived out that belief and they lived out that belief in that the person who had hurt them and made them terrified was still someone they felt to be obligated to be in a healthy relationship with. And then they got down to the really, real world hard work of figuring out how to do that. The process they used with the Arlington police and the court system is called restorative justice. The Center for Justice and Reconciliation says that restorative justice is a theory of justice that emphasizes repairing the harm caused by criminal behavior. It is best accomplished through cooperative processes that allow all willing stakeholders to meet, although other approaches are available when that becomes impossible, and this leads to the transformation of people, relationships, and communities. The foundational principles of restorative justice are crime causes harm and justice should focus on repairing the harm. That the people most affected by the crime should be able to actively participate in its resolution. The responsibility of the government is to maintain order, but the responsibility of the community is to build peace. If restorative justice were a building, the center says it would have four corner posts. The inclusion of all parties involved, an encounter with the other side, making amends for harm, and reintegration of the parties into relationship with each other and the community. Restorative justice is a very different way of thinking about crime and punishment and our response to crime. Our response to crime focuses on repairing the harm caused by crime and reducing future harm through crime prevention. But frequently this just means being assigned a punishment for our wrongdoing, jail time, fine. Restorative justice requires offenders to really personally learn, understand, and take responsibility for their actions and the harm that they have caused. It seeks actual and real redress for victims, recompense by the offenders, reintegration of both the offender and the victim into the community, and it requires a cooperative effort by individuals, offenders, victims, communities, and law enforcement. So how did all that work out with the Arlington Church? Well, the police eventually caught the suspect. And the Arlington Church requested that he not be sent through the usual channels. That in this case, it fit to be one of the options where they could request the restorative justice process in that community. And so they brought the criminal into a discussion process in the restorative justice method. They made the offender talk to them, understand their hurt. They tried to understand what made him commit the crime. They asked him to educate himself about race and what a difficult and expansive and intensive and societally wide problem it is and how it is embedded in our culture, even so much that they themselves at the church often miss its damaging effects. They forgave him. They did not excuse what he did or at any point said it was okay that he behaved such a way, but they lived out their relationship to him invited him to join into it. It was difficult for both parties. In the process, the people in the court system, the police and the community were educated about racism in a way they might not have been otherwise. 
And to a very real extent, everyone involved won. Peter won, the church won, and the community won. The usual criminal justice approach all too often creates a situation where everyone loses at least a little bit. It seems crazy. It seems a backwards way to go about crime and punishment. And I think one reason forgiveness is so difficult to practice is that our entire culture and our entire history holds it up as a value, but at the same time never really puts into practice processes that encourage it and teach us how to actually do it. From the criminal justice system at a macro level to life partnerships and parenting at a micro level, we have been trained to deal out punishment when hurt and offended instead of working to create healing, repair fracture, and maintain healthy connection to all, with all, and for all. Thinking about justice in terms of relationship, repair, and forgiveness is completely foreign to the way our society has developed. It is ingrained in us that justice is retributive, that unless a punishment is suffered, there is no pain for the crime. Forgiveness may be nice and a great ideal, but it really has no place in justice. It's above and beyond. Forgiveness is an extra for the virtuous. In our culture, this is as old as the Bible. We heard the reading from Exodus today, right? An eye for an eye, life for a life. Here are the commandments, says God. Break them and God hates you and condemns you. Follow them and God accepts you and loves you. Right equals obedience. But obedience is a one-way relationship and therefore not a very healthy one. In the reading this morning from Exodus, an eye for an eye is not a licensing of revenge. Instead, it is actually, by the people who wrote it, meant to be something that put a limit on revenge taking. An eye for an eye, limb for a limb, life for a life, one for one, but not more than one for one. For more, Dealing out more in revenge leads to situations which in their time and culture escalated things extensively. So a life for life, an eye for an eye, instead of I kill you, your family kills my family, my tribe kills your tribe, your tribe brings war against my country. We still see how this goes on and on, don't we? So an eye for an eye was an injunction they created to put a limit on that process where there's enough, being as fair as they thought they could be. Strangely enough, the focus of that eye for an eye law in its own culture was to focus on minimizing harm, limiting revenge, and restoring relationship. But we've interpreted it otherwise ever since. Justice demands we take vengeance out on you by inflicting pain on you so you know you have done wrong. This has led not only to violent societies that see forgiveness as weak, but to violent relationships, violent families. If you hurt me, I must hurt you back so you understand the hurt. When I was a small child, my dad hit us, mostly me. My younger brother was almost too young at that time to be hit. If you broke the rules, my dad would fly into a rage and hit us. His favorite method was whipping us with a belt. Sometimes he used his hands. Those were easier. Not surprisingly, my parents divorced by the time I was 10. And one of the reasons was my father's anger. After the divorce, my dad actually got better with the anger and stopped hitting us. But one of the things he refused to do was to take part in mandatory family counseling. He went to a couple sessions, then in one of his rages, and I remember this vividly as a 10-year-old, screamed that he didn't understand why he was here. 
he had done nothing wrong and got up and left and never came back to another one of them. That severed relational connection between me and my dad and my brother for a long time. Even though in many ways he behaved much better, he was actually one of the people who taught me about fairness and equity and social justice and things. So I'm really quite happy that one of the areas where our culture has made some progress with restorative justice is in the realm of parenting. In a restorative process, when things go wrong, offenders are taken through a series of reflections. What happened? What were you thinking? <laughs> Who did you affect? Who was hurt? How can things be made better? More and more, this type of restorative process has become the way we deal with children. The way my father dealt with children becomes increasingly less and less a method that is practiced with vigor and enthusiasm. In my lifetime, I've seen parenting move towards this restorative justice approach. It's a much better path than being whipped with the belt in the bottom. Schools use the restorative justice process more and more. Who was hurt? Why did you do that? How can you make it better? This increasingly becomes a school disciplinary method instead of staying after school suspension and detention. With the restorative process forcing relationship in the contemplation and practice of forgiveness. Instead of severing the relationship by removing somebody who committed a wrong from relationship with their class, their school, their teachers, and just isolate them. It's kind of like prison when you think of it. Restorative justice approaches with children at home and school are so important because they emphasize understanding. Why did you do that? Do you understand how it hurts someone else? This way seeks to involve young people in learning how to repair and not sever relationship when things go wrong. And when we teach this type of process to children, and to each other as adults, what we are actually teaching is a method of forgiveness. Not that saying wrongs are okay, but how do we repair the hurt within the offender and within the person who is hurt? For when emotional and relational connections are severed, no one wins. And paradoxically, a culture built on retributive justice, such as ours, fosters a culture, a culture of power over in relationships. The concept of power over being so important and influential to all types of social injustice then grows and we get ever more powerful and damaging ageism and racism and sexism and homophobia. All those related things. A power over society becomes a society where winning is more important than healing and seeking actual repair of relationship and justice. And our society is all about winning. There's a great scene in the, the famous 1980s movies, The Breakfast Club, one of my, one of my favorites. And it's a great illustration of this. Four kids are sent for various wrongdoings to a day-long Saturday detention at their high school. So they're being punished. They broke the rule, they're paying the penalty, retributive justice. And yet what happens while they're there together all day is they start to talk to each other. And through the talking, they start to understand why they did what they did and how it hurt the people they wronged. It wasn't a magic cure-all, but you see this process go on with them of restoring instead of just taking their punishment. And one of the things that emphasizes the culture of winning in that movie is one of the characters is an athlete, 
and he talks about why he bullied a kid. And he says it's the way his father treated him, right? It doesn't excuse it, but it explains it so vividly. You know, his dad's all about being a winner. You must be a winner, Andrew. Succeed, win, win, win. No wonder somebody raised like that ends up being a bully. Or president. No. <laughs> oh. Andrew, I won't tolerate any losers in this family. Win, win, win. Our entire culture is like this. Life is not to be experienced or savored or even struggled through. It is to be won. We use this as a common commentary on our daily lives. Oh, that wins. Fail. Right? This has become our common language. You are either a winner or a loser, as the president so often reminds us on Twitter. <laughs> For our politics, even, is not fostering healthy relationships between and among our people or making sure we treat everyone fairly. Our politics is about winning. We wonder why our government is fractured and politicians so divided that they can almost never work together for the common good. Because it's not about restoration and healing and justice. It's about power, getting one's way, upholding your ideology at the expense of what benefits the rest of society. Forgiveness and restoration and healing are weaknesses that get in the way of winning. Nowhere has this been more evident in the last couple of weeks than the debate over the health care bill. Republicans lost that bill because it was all about getting one's way instead of finding a real solution to the real problems of expensive health care. All they wanted to do was get rid of the other law. They didn't really work on how anything new would actually help anybody. Because it's not about that. Our politics is about winning. Our government follows us now on immigration. Just follow our new immigration rules. Don't question it. Certainly don't let the courts question it. It's about winning, not about figuring out whether we actually need a different policy for that or not, or if we're just doing ourselves more harm by having bans and such. Our legal and criminal justice system is about winning. The result of our court cases, both criminal and civil, is who won the case, not was justice served, is repair and healing going to happen, will the victim's needs be addressed, will the offender not lose their humanity in the process. We can all name instances where the person or corporation, because they're people now, in the wrong in a court case actually won the case. Because our system of justice is not about justice. It's about winning. The prescribed penalty doesn't always do justice in this system. Or heal the victim or the offender. Three strikes and you're out. Regardless of extenuating circumstances, because obviously this rule can apply to every situation without fail. And we know it doesn't. The strange thing about punishment as the method of criminal justice is it actually inhibits what we want it to do. We use the name in criminal justice rehabilitation and corrections, but our system doesn't correct or rehabilitate. It can't. Scientifically, it can't. There's neurological evidence now that people who have committed really bad crimes have a deficiency in the, in the amygdala, which controls connection and processing emotions. And our brains actually are continually growing and repairing themselves. Up to 20% of your brain is new at any given time. And so if our brains can continue to repair and heal, and people who are committing crimes have deficiency in the, the amygdala, one of the worst ways to inhibit brain growth is to sever people from relationships, put them in isolation or in relationships that are structurally unhealthy and enforce their own internal isolation. 
How do we expect people with the deficiency in the brain that causes them to be criminals to not be criminals anymore when we put them in a system that actively creates more of the cause of their problem? It's because we're about retribution and not restoration. Our relationships are the same. We get in fights with loved ones, and we get in arguments, and we pull out things we know will hurt them, so we can win the fight. Prove that we were the most wrong in this relationship. And then we'll give them back the emotional pain and anger they gave us, or resentment in equal measure. In a society that's all about winning and retribution, there is no need to practice forgiveness. Because winners don't ask forgiveness for winning. It's not necessary. Forgiveness requires that we go beyond winning and retribution and matching an offense to a prescribed punishment. Forgiveness requires we go beyond revenge having power over one another. Part of the success of restorative justice approaches, be they in the home or the school or in prisons, is that they focus on creating win-win situations where every participant gets at least some measure of healing and fairness and restoration. Philosopher James P. Curse in his book Finite and Infinite Games suggests there are two types of games finite and infinite. Finite games are played for the purpose of winning. Infinite games are played for the purpose of continuing the play. Finite games are bound by rules within which, in the framework of the game, there is a winner and loser. For example, monopoly, football, poker, politics, law, relationships, criminal justice. There are a multitude of finite games. We are conditioned that finite games are the only kind. But, as Kirsch reminds us, there is one other type of game, an infinite game. And there is only one infinite game, where the goal is to continue the play and continually to bring more people in as players. When we treat life as a finite game, we have trouble with forgiveness. But when we treat life as an infinite game, where the purpose is to continue the play with as many people as possible, and then treat each other not as opponents, but partners, then we begin to seek not punishment, but pardon. Our system of retribution inhibits and actually discourages the practice of forgiveness. But restorative systems of justice encourage the healing and repair of relationship necessary for that very forgiveness. <clears throat>